Buddhism, Sanjay Tham, Jay Jim, Vidyan Jogur, Jansar Chabda, Jinjin Sawe, Lama Shabdur, Grim, Hame Pala, Gosam, Rabdu, Gabeg, Vane Chak, Sarashin Chapsun, Yevarji, Dachin Sanjin Tham, Jay Jay Lotus, Jor, Jinjay Lotus, or Chalandu Jor, Jinjay Lotus, or Lam Chubas, or Jinjay Lotus, or Chubaye Jesu Char, or Jinjay Lotus. O menci ceyin ce paranla, dozun sanca kuncun o anı, ransın çokurun ansın tın sebe, sağı ila meşabla sorba de, kuncu topa babar cinci laptu, su sınca namci sampadan, lai çeca cita var, çeçon tomon tepayi, çeci kolu kurdu su, çasar vatan cecin çabadan, cezu yiran kurcin suvayi, Geva chung se da ge chi sa pa thang che so pe chan ju chen bo Homage to the Guru, homage to the Dharma. Good evening fellow truth seekers. <laughs> In that I feel a very close kinship with you, and as always I find it auspicious and significant to find the occasion to be together to share Dharma. And this close kinship is very easily exemplified by um, the quotation, the passage that was read last night from the epistles or the writings, the letters of Swami Shivananda where he talked about the truth because it reminded me very closely of a quotation I like very much which is from a 13th century Buddhist master named Rungzom Mahapandita who said in defining Dharma that Dharma is what is true and what is beneficial and it is true because it is beneficial, and it is beneficial because it is true. And so whenever I'm called upon to share Dharma, I always think of this, and it brings to mind this little kind of teacher's mantra that came to me one day that I share with you in case any of you ever find it useful when you're sitting up here or doing something similar. And that is, not by me, not for me, not about me. Not by me, my teacher, the Lord of Refuge, Tukul Urjan Rinpoche, used to say, just because I'm talking to you about Dharma, don't think I am something special, because the best, the best I can possibly do is simply accurately repeat the words of the Buddha who expressed the truth perfectly. That's the best case. So how to improve on that? Why would one want to alter that? So not by me. Not for me means that when we share the Dharma with one another, in order for that sharing to be everything it's meant to be, to do everything it's meant to do, it's important first to purify the mind of what we call the worldly dharmas, which is to think it's for me, for my reputation, for my popularity, for my income, for my pleasure, and so on. Because that corruption or adulteration kind of closes or damages the channel for Dharma to really transmit itself to itself, from awareness to awareness. Not by me, not for me, not about me. Not part of my story that you can like on Facebook or that goes on a resume. Not just part of my calendar or my schedule, but again, part of the larger universal story, of the evolutionary unfolding of this transmission of truth. And so I hope in these few minutes we have together that I am able to share something that feels useful, beneficial, and true to you. And the title of this symposium, Meditation as a Path to Enlightenment, 
and that got me thinking. Is meditation by itself or in and of itself a path, let alone the path, to enlightenment? And I think if we define meditation narrowly or strictly as bhavana or dhyana or samadhi, as familiarization or cultivation, as concentration, as absorption, then clearly we have to say the answer is no. Meditation is a tool, a method, a technique, a set of techniques. But by itself, it is not, cannot be a path to enlightenment. And so I prefer this title, maybe you can try it next year, Yoga as a Path to Enlightenment. And why do I say that? Not just so you'll like me and think, oh, he's a yoga person after all. <laughs> but because we use the term yoga in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition in particular to mean the comprehensive system of practices, the way of living that constitutes a path. Because yoga in Tibetan is nal jor, it's two syllables. And jor is what you usually think of as yoga. Jor means to connect, or to join, or to unite, or reunite, reconnect. But the nal means the natural state. So to reconnect with that which is already our natural state, or the true state of our being, is yoga. Mm -hmm. Call it Buddha nature, if you like. And then we have the word enlightenment, a path to enlightenment. Interestingly, both the word for training on the path and the word for enlightenment in Tibetan to show the intrinsic relationship of these terms or these stages, you can say. Because enlightenment is actually better translated awakening, maybe. And in Tibetan, again, two syllables, changjup, changjup, and this is the completion of the process of purification, jang on the one hand, and maturation or blossoming of positive natural qualities on the other hand, chup, changjup. So while we are training on the path, we say sap jang, we're accumulating the positive and purifying jang, the negative. And when this process is complete, we say chang jup. And chang jup is bodhi. Again, Sanskrit is one word, bodhi. The Tibetan chang jup, the full completion of this process of purification and maturation. And so that's why Yoga includes all of the practices and ways of living that are necessary to that process and to complete that process. And at every level of the Buddha's teachings, there is such a complete system which can be described using the word yoga. We call them vehicles or yanas. And first there is the general or common vehicle, you could say the fundamental set of teachings of the Buddha. And here, the complete set of yoga techniques is threefold, just three. They're called prajna, shila, and samadhi. So samadhi, the concentration or absorption, is just one of the three necessary elements that along with shila, or a disciplined conduct, or right way of living or conducting oneself, those are the supporting pillars for the application of prajna. When one's activity of body, speech, and mind are proper and correct and disciplined, then naturally the negativities of body, speech, and mind are purified, the mind comes to rest, the energy settles in a aligned and properly flowing fashion that settles the mind, brings clarity to mind. So with the meditation and the right way of living, then 
with the clarity and stability of mind, we apply the quality, the innate quality of mind, its intelligent ability to observe and understand the qualities and the nature of whatever object is before it. And finally, the object that mind places before it and observes and analyzes and understands is its own nature. So that is the set of yoga techniques according to the general or basic vehicle of the Buddha's teachings. Then we have what is described as the Mahayana or the great vehicle. And if in the first vehicle we had three basic terms to describe the yoga or the practice, here in the Mahayana it comes down to just one word. And that word is bodhi, the same bodhi as before, the awakening or enlightenment. But it's bodhicitta. Bodhicitta. And bodhicitta means the mind of enlightenment, the attitude of enlightenment, the aspiration to attain enlightenment. And it refers to our basic or intrinsic potential by our very nature to realize enlightenment. And I'll explain that a bit shortly. <coughs> the training in a bodhicitta has different aspects, however, including what is called relative bodhicitta and ultimate bodhicitta. Training in cultivating the mind set on attaining enlightenment. And what makes this the great vehicle is that rather than have a sense that this is my journey to enlightenment, my personal path, my practice, my yoga. The foundation of Mahayana Yoga is the understanding that all that we perceive, all that we experience, all that we can think of is merely and thoroughly interdependent by nature. There is nothing that exists, that appears, that can be experienced, that is independent in any true sense. And therefore, as one applies the faculty of prajna to one's experience, it starts to seem completely senseless to think of my enlightenment. If everything is an interdependent arising set of experiences and phenomena, then what would it mean for one isolated piece of that to be enlightened and the rest not? It actually does not make sense when you analyze and think about it carefully. And so bodhicitta is the commitment, the determination to bring all of existence to the state of bodhi, to the state of awakening. And the relative bodhicitta includes this exact aspiration, it includes many practices such as what are called the paramitas or the transcendent virtues. It includes uh, training in what is called the exchange of self and other. Because one has identified the preoccupation with the sense of an independent self with the welfare of a personal, independently existing self, as the very problem that is obstructing one's realization, one's awakening, one's enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And so the practice is to break through the mental patterns, the emotional patterns, all of the habitual constructs of our experience that in any way solidify this false sense of separateness or isolation. And so there are powerful techniques, including applying breathing back and forth to open up, to release, to let go, to cut through all grasping and fixation. Because as long as one is so busy thinking about this sense of self, one actually doesn't even notice other people, not really. Have you noticed that? It's only when the clouds clear and that grasping and tightness and the kind of bubble of one's self-identification becomes more light or transparent that one actually sees 
all of the manifestations, all of the expressions of happiness and unhappiness, suffering and so on, and therefore can respond to them with compassion. This is training in relative bodhicitta. It means training in the four boundless contemplations that is wishing all beings happiness and the causes of happiness, wishing all beings to be free of suffering and the causes of suffering, wishing all beings joy that is beyond suffering, and having a state of, you could say, boundless and groundless equanimity towards all beings without partiality, without preference without a sense of close and far, or dear and distant. Compassion, I said, was wishing beings to be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. Seeing the manifest suffering of beings and wishing them to be free of it is only, you could say, level one, superficial compassion. Seeing the actual causes of suffering in one's own and other beings' minds and their experience is a deeper level of compassion. It's called in our system compassion towards dharmas, towards phenomena, understanding how phenomena work, what actually produces happiness, what actually produces suffering. And then finally there is referenceless compassion, which is compassion that recognizes that dualistic, the dualistic framework of self and other, of mind and its experience as separate, what we call the paradigm of grasping and fixation, is itself the source of all problems. And therefore, resting in non-dual awareness without any reference point, simply being compassion, itself, embodying the quality of compassion without thought, without concept, without restriction, is ultimate bodhicitta, and called compassion without a reference point. So this is the Mahayana yoga system. Then in the general Vajrayana system, we have many kinds of yoga techniques, here we start talking about sadhanas, or methods of accomplishment, twofold yoga of development stage and completion stage, and so on. But all of the lineages, all of the traditions of Tibetan Buddhism agree that this vehicle is comprehended or included in simply one practice, and here are just two words, this time two words. Guru Yoga. Guru Yoga. This is the actual term we use. Even Tibetans don't use the Tibetan so much, Lame Naljo. They use the Sanskrit Guru Yoga. Guru Yoga. The Guru means not just an individual person, but it means all expressions of wisdom in every form in which they appear. And it, the yoga part is our mindful, devoted, pure cultivation of the ability to recognize and work with those wisdom messages in all of those forms and all of those manifestations. So we say that all sights, all sounds, all mental events are the play of the mandalas of the guru's body, speech, and mind. This is the practice of guru yoga. So it's very profound and all-inclusive. So there are many yogas, but all of them are contained within and best practiced through guru yoga in the general mantra system. And finally, there's a vehicle that's called the pinnacle vehicle, or the ati yoga also called Dzogchen, or Great Perfection. And here the entire path or system can be expressed in three simple statements. Mo rang tok tu chet, tak chik tok tu chet, 
then roll tok tu cha. And if you want to know what those mean, you'll have to come to the workshop tomorrow. <laughs> so tomorrow we'll uh, explore each of these different yoga systems experientially a little bit together, and that one as well, explaining these three statements, which are attributed to the first human master of Dzogchen in this world, named Garabdorje, an Indian master named Prahivatra. I should go back for a second and mention when we talk about Mahayana, the bodhicitta yoga, that one of the key elements of the practice is to begin with this aspiration, to at best remain in the non-conceptual state of compassionate awareness during the practice, whatever the practice might be, the main part, and then to conclude with a dedication of all of the virtue and roots of virtue to the welfare, to the enlightenment of all beings. So that is why at the beginning of the session I invoke the wisdom blessings of the guru and the lineage, but also dedicate whatever is going to come next to the welfare and the liberation, the enlightenment of all beings. So this is called the Dampa Somar, the three excellent features, excellence at the beginning, excellence in the middle, and excellence at the end. All of these different systems in Buddha Dharma work because of what mind itself actually is. Mind all of our minds, the mind of every sentient being, of every transient being, every living being, the mind is that which has no concrete definition, though it is always trying to assert some definition for itself when confused or deluded. But in reality, in substance, there is no finite or concrete limitation or definition to mind. This is its openness or emptiness. But on top of that, and inseparable from that, is the mind's cognizant or self-knowing quality, we can say, natural awareness or self-knowing awareness. So when we experience anything at all, we not only experience an object, but at least potentially can be aware that we are having that experience as we are having it in that very moment. Awareness suffuses or permeates all of our experience. And the very problem arises when we forget that self-knowing aspect of mind and get completely caught up in mere appearance that mind observes or experiences, forgetting the self-knowing part. The image we use is of the candle flame. When a flame is lit, it illuminates itself from within as it casts light and shines on objects around it. This is an image we use for this uh, quality of mind. And because mind is rangrik or self-knowing in its nature, and because it is unlimited in its essence, and because it can experience any and every kind of appearance, then everything mind needs in order to realize its own nature is transparently available to it. When it is clear, when it is stable, when it is open, focused, pure, then again this prajna quality of discriminating or discerning intelligence can be applied and see whatever needs to be seen. That is why meditation works. Because what do we remember or remember to remember when we meditate? We remember to remember that we are having this moment of experience and therefore can look exactly at it and see what it is showing us, what it is telling us, where we are holding, where we are resisting, where we are clinging, what kind of old story we are repeating, what kind of wound we are in the process of protecting, we are actually recreating over and over again. 
everything we need to learn and understand in order to travel this yoga path to enlightenment, we can learn from our own minds, from their true nature. This is the core, the common core of all of the path, at all of these levels, all of these yanas, all of these vehicles. This brings up the main point I wanted to talk about tonight, which is empowerment. Empowerment simply means that at some point, if our path is going to be a genuine path that leads to awakening, somehow we need to be reintroduced to this nature of mind that is our own birthright, that is our own nature, our own Buddha nature, our own awakened potential. This pointing out or this reintroduction so that we recognize and can work with our own mind nature is what we mean by empowerment. We can say with, without empowerment, <coughs> There is no final path, there is no possibility of enlightenment. And in Tibetan we say, Minpei Wang Dang Drawway Trip. Minpei Wang means the ripening or maturing empowerment, and Drawway Trip means the instructions or the practice instructions which bring about actual liberation. This introduction to our own basic nature, our open awareness nature, which has latent or intrinsic within it all the potential to manifest all of the qualities of the enlightened state. This can occur in a formal ceremony or not. It can be very elaborate or very simple. What's important is that it actually works. And it works, and here's the connection with Guru Yoga, it works most often, sometimes best, in the living and actual relationship between a teacher and a student, a Guru and Chala, a teacher and disciple, because the Guru is one who is more mature and more stable and more advanced in working in having this recognition and developing qualities of realization on the basis of this recognition of mind nature, and therefore is in a position to literally show that through their being, through words, through gestures, through ritual, to a disciple who is interested and ready to acknowledge that, to experience that. I want to pause or sidetrack for a second and talk about meditation as not a path to enlightenment before I go on. This is kind of a critical point, splitting off point. You may have noticed that when you do your yoga practice, meaning the asanas and the different kinds of you know, karma yoga and so on, that as things become more settled and clear, your mind becomes very light and spacious, Relax that your experience becomes more interesting and more enjoyable. So unless there is this firm resolve from the beginning that we are practicing in order to awaken to our own true nature, to liberate ourselves and others, unless that yoga is itself integrated into everything we do, it's easy for everything to just become a yoga vacation. Some of the teachers say, without the bodhicitta practice, without the motivation, without the goal, then simply practicing absorption, concentration of mind, of mind you become like a, an athlete, an expert in meditation, the result of which you can be born, as, as they used to say when I was a kid, 
And people would denigrate meditation who didn't know anything about it. Oh, he's contemplating his navel. That's what they used to say. Did you ever hear that one? You can be born in a dhyana paradise, in a formless realm, where you remain for eons in a state of deep absorption of no use to yourself or anyone else. That's the best case. The worst case is you are reborn, the Tibetan lamas say, as a hibernating animal that prefers the deep absorption of deep sleep to any state of conscious awareness. This is not what meditation should be about. And it shouldn't be about just experiencing the delectable taste of a fruit because you're so conscious and so aware. Just feeling the sun on your skin. Ah, paradise. Paradise island. This is called, in our system, the Mara of the Devaputra the child of the gods, or the, the demon of sensual fascination. So you actually can use the power of meditation and of yoga to reinforce the intensity and the pleasurability of your personal sensory experience. And maybe it's good as a healing step, but it's not the final goal. Not the final goal. So I was talking about empowerment and how it can be simple or complex, but it's really about recognizing the meaning of what the guru is pointing out, which is one's own nature, and the potential within one's nature to fully awaken to that nature. It's essentially saying that you are now ready to be a mature, grown-up, spiritual being. And think about in a very worldly context, like you study and study for many years in school, and then there's this ceremony or ritual, someone hands you a rolled up piece of paper on a stage and you wear a funny hat, and this is your graduation ceremony, and maybe there's nothing even on the page, but it's symbolic, right? And it, on the one hand, it's a, it's a um, confirmation that you have reached a certain point on your journey, but that's where the real work begins. It's handing over to you in the form of a piece of paper the responsibility to now make something of your own journey, to take it into your own hands and apply what you have been taught in order to realize the fullest fruition possible. A grown-up person, grown-up spiritual being is one who learns how to travel the path by applying all of the doorway treat, the liberating instructions, to their own experience. To make all the necessary choices and decisions, moment to moment to moment, discerningly, intelligently, carefully. It's an acknowledgement that we can be grown-up spiritual beings because that is our own innate capacity to become mature, judicious, kind, responsible beings. That is our awakened potential. So this maturation is another way to describe the yoga or the practice of the path, the training and purification and the blossoming of Uh, positive qualities. Uh, Another interesting sidelight, in the Tibetan tradition there is a mythos, I think in Christianity you use the word eschatology, of the final days. Is that the right word? I'm looking at Pastor Don. (laughs) What happens in the end, the end story of where this is all heading, this world? This is called the the myth of Shambhala. And in Shambhala, there's like this great assembly or this enlightened society of spiritual warriors called the Bodhisattvas. And they are opposing what are called the barbarian forces. The barbarian forces who are hell-bent on corrupting everyone and everything in this world. And the way the story ends is that the king the Rigden or awareness holder king of Shambhala pierces the heart of the barbarian general. And this ends the war. And the name of this general is Chipe Lodru in Tibetan. 
Chipe Lodru means childish intellect or clever child. So you can contrast the mature spiritual being with the very clever child that uses all skill and intelligence in order to pursue the ends and purposes of this uh, false sense of ego separation. So we can use this as a model or an analogy for what we see around us in the world. You can say that everything that is identifiably wrong or difficult with this world, with human society, with how so-called grown-ups treat one another, is due to the prevalence of the childish intellect or the clever child in us and in others and the goals that the clever child pursues. As spiritual beings, we must mature, having been empowered, having recognized our nature, having committed to practice the path of yoga. We have to do, what did you say yesterday, the inconvenient work, I like that, the inconvenient work of dealing with our minds as we find them right now, with our hearts as we find them right now, which is with a lot of our own stuff, our own garbage, our own confused thoughts, our own disturbed emotions, our own strong clinging and aversion, and take responsibility for our own maturation. Take responsibility, recognize our shortcomings, our defects, apply the techniques of yoga that we've learned, and gradually purify, ripen, and mature. His Holiness the Dalai Lama said about Shila, about disciplined conduct, or what we call in the Paramita context, Sultrim, or the transcendent virtue of disciplined conduct. He says it really just comes down to deferred gratification. A child cannot defer gratification without being miserable. A mature adult being can. Because an adult can place things in the proper perspective. I want to give you some more examples that contrast the childish mind that we all confront and must deal with and purify with the mature mind of the developing and advancing practitioner on the path to enlightenment. A childish mind, a childish being, never thinks that it soon must die and what that implies. A mature person appreciates and plans their next moments in life in full recognition that life is fleeting and opportunities never return. And so this opportunity must be seized. A child cannot be kind without demanding or expecting kindness in return because a child is insecure and selfish. A mature person appreciates kindness for the chance to bring happiness to someone else and doesn't need anything in return because there is no way to be secure, and that's okay. There is no way to make ourselves secure. No matter what nice things people might say about us, no matter what nice objects they might give us, no matter what conditions we might create around our physical being, our emotional being, our mental being, there is no security in a world that is transient, impermanent, and interdependent through and through by its very nature. This is the adult's understanding. And one term I've come up with here uh, is based on the idea that is very popular nowadays of you know, carbon offsets and carbon footprints, how you don't want to create more pollution, then you create purity or cleanliness or rejuvenation of the environment to counteract or compensate for that. Well, how about karmic footprint? How about paying attention to our karmic footprint is how a mature spiritual being lives their life. There's a great contemporary master, 
passed away not too long ago in Tibet named Kempo Jigni Kunzo. And he used to tell his students, one of whom stayed with me a few years back and related this to me. He said, we are all born in this world from the mud and mire, from the apparent coarseness of the elements. But at some point, we can take responsibility to blossom into the flowers of our own existence, of our own lives. And by becoming, even if short-lived, a beautiful flower as the product of our own life, our own being in this world, then we bring some moments of beauty, joy, potentially wisdom to others. So this is, this is how to think about it. An adult, mature, spiritual being on the path appreciates that anger and destructive action never solve any problem for good, and these aggressive tendencies invite more trouble. They bring no safety, no contentment, and no security. Attachment brings no end to craving, and craving itself is extremely uncomfortable. The only time we are truly content and relaxed is when we let go and don't want or need anything at all. It's the absence of clinging that brings peace and contentment. Basic spiritual teachings. These are things that parents should teach their children so that they can grow up to become wise and mature. Basic truths about human existence. Ignorance, we covered aggression, attachment, now ignorance, the three major poisons. Ignorance is disregarding that we and all that we experience are fleeting and momentary without solidity, with no unchanging core, with nothing independent, as I mentioned before. Nothing is truly lasting or reliable. And so we must give up trying to stabilize, control, manage, and secure our own lives by seeing the terrible cost of living every moment with that kind of intense anxiety. We see the price of living with the stress and dissatisfaction with how things are in this very moment over and over and over again. The mature practitioner sees that any kind of sensory gratification or indulgence of the imagination even quickly leads to jadedness, boredom or anxiety because there is a finite energy that fuels the senses, that fuels the imagination. And when we expend or devote that energy outwardly to trying to grasp and think at these temporary experiences, then this finite store of energy is diverted, polluted, exhausted, and degraded. So we end up needing more and more and enjoying it less and less. Isn't this true? Is this true? Yes. Is it beneficial? Beneficial because it is true. Beneficial to know. That's what Rongzo meant. Because when we know, then there's something we can do. We can make an intelligent choice. Childish people want, and I'm not talking about those other childish people, I'm talking about our own childish mentality. Okay? This is not an us and them kind of discussion. The childish mind wants more and more luxury and comfort, more power, more influence, and tolerates less and less the more it gets what it wants. We want smarter and smarter phones, but they don't make us smarter and smarter, do they? <laughs> the childish mind is always desperately pursuing some receding fantasy vision of lasting contentment of happiness and happiness that is never grasped, and so never experiences deep happiness and contentment, and finds it difficult to actually pay attention to what is really happening in our lives, right here and right now, in our world, until it is almost too late. Most fundamentally, the childish mind is the mind that mistakes its own thoughts 
which revolve almost entirely around itself, mistake these thoughts, these self-constructs, for truth and reality. The childish mind implicitly believes, without questioning or examining, childish mind believes that its own thoughts are just factually reporting the truth. Isn't it? I am hungry. Oh, okay, I better go eat. What is the nature of that thought? Where does it come from? Where does it abide? Where does it go? Prajna, the intelligent, mature faculty of mind, can examine that. Realize something deeper. I see I'm running short of time. Let me get back to just one point and then I'll close. I mentioned the maturing empowerment and the liberating instructions. The instructions, the teachings that we receive from qualified teachers, whether that it is lung or tokpe, chu, meaning the scriptural or written transmissions or the actual living transmissions from a personal teacher or a lineage of awakened teachers. They liberate our minds because these instructions are not just one more story, one more competing story. One more story told by a self-interested being trying to convince us why we should act in their interest. (laughs) Best example of this is how much money people make selling systems to other people on how to make money. You know what I'm talking about? My five-step system to becoming rich. It only costs you $199, and you'll learn everything you need to know to become rich. So who gets rich? Dharma instruction is not like that. There is no such self-interest or distortion, because the source is wisdom, the source is compassion. And so those who have more fully and deeply integrated the wisdom teachings into their being through traversing this path to awakening are best positioned and best qualified to show us how we can replicate their examples, their life examples, and travel the path the way they have before us. They can provide us with access to liberation. So it's like empowerment introduces or charges and instructions liberate. The presence of genuinely mature spiritual human beings who can teach us how to liberate our own being and to benefit others is incredibly precious, inconceivably precious. And the importance of a teacher is that a shining and at best even a living example of what it is like to be a mature, compassionate, wise human being, is what is often needed for us to be willing to let go of our deep, paranoid, compulsive trust in our own ego. That trust, that surrender, that release, that opening, is the teaching, is a path is the access to liberation itself. To use a simple or material example, it's like empowerment is like a charged car battery that you connect with a wire to a dead battery. The dead battery is not really dead, right? It has the potential to operate again, it's just dormant. The power is temporarily suppressed, not operational. You connect the wires, then the charge flows through, and some power of what it is like to be free, actually free of selfish, self-interested thought and emotion, some sense of that actually gets transmitted, and therefore some confidence is won, some recognition is born. And then the second battery is attuned to a different energy level or a different frequency. The energy and power of wisdom and compassion, free of grasping, is pointed out, transmitted, shared. It crosses the gap. 
is like mirrors pointing back to each other, points out and reawakens the capacity within ourselves, within the recipient of battery. So it's not really like something is being handed over, because if the uh, second battery didn't have the ability to be a battery, nothing would happen. Right? Electricity is just electricity, power is just power. But the second battery has the capacity to hold that charge once the charge is introduced. And how does it do that? By running the engine correctly over and over again, keeping the engine tuned keeping the battery charged. This is what our own practice, liberating instructions, accomplishes. In closing, I want to share with you my prayer and aspiration for a world through our selfless efforts and the selfless efforts of so many, a world where most people, if not all people, become mature and not childish, because in such a world, the world of Shambhala, when the Bodhisattva warriors pierce the heart of the clever child you know, forever, in such a world no one would go hungry, no one would be denied access to essential medical care, no one would be abused, no one would be attacked with weapons, no one would be cheated, and no one who is in a state of discomfort or suffering, even on the first level of suffering that we talked about, just not having enough to eat, not having shelter, and so on, no one in such a state would be ignored while we upgrade our smartphones and while we use our smartphones to research where is the next interesting place to enjoy Indian food or sushi. That would not occupy the time, effort, and attention of mature spiritual beings, and the world itself would be transformed. So nam diye tamche zipan ye tob ne ne pe da nam pamche shanje ga na che bhagam ke pari. May Bodhicitta, the mind of awakening, be born where it has not yet arisen. And where it has arisen, may it not decay, but instead grow more and more and more to completion.